We are back to HMV in Newbury today, as we are meeting Trevor Iris, and Newbury is roughly halfway between where we both live, and a perfectly suitable meeting place to act as a backdrop for this look into what goes into the authoring of Blu-ray discs. My own experience is certainly not on the same level as Trevor's, and so this was a perfect opportunity to get the full story for someone who has been involved for many years. This won't all be talking, as we'll show many interesting releases and also get a good poke around the fabulous Newbury HMV, where they have a wonderful staff and an almost cinematic look with a large warehouse style and some great artwork and graffiti on the walls. For many of us, 4K is the mainstay of the home movie hobby today, and every HMV you ever visit always has a good selection to choose from. Both Trevor and myself have been collecting on the 4K format for some time, but we're both also avid Blu-ray collectors, and it is the Blu-ray format that Trevor worked with for many years. The process of authoring a 4K disc is very much the same as a standard Blu-ray, only it will cost even more to produce, and dependent on the special features included, even longer to master and then author. As collectors we have a vast array of titles to choose from, and any visit to HMV can be a danger to the wallet, but there is something special about being able to own a film, and for comparatively little when you think about how much a feature film for the home used to cost, because before home video came along you could spend around £150 for a feature, and I'm talking more than 40 years ago here. I've been thinking for a while that I need to be a little more understanding of what goes into a disc release, particularly when something isn't quite as intuitive as I would have liked. And so to start this look into the disc authoring process, I first asked Trevor to tell us about the roles he carried out, and how long he had been in those roles. Um, so I spent seven years at one company, and uh, just the single year at another company. Um, but they were two different types of jobs. There was quality assurance, and uh, quality control. So the quality assurance comes after the quality control, um, but there's still a lot involved. And uh, that would consist of getting what we call check discs. Basically, it's uh, a finished disc, a finished product, but it doesn't have the fancy picture that you might see when you get it at home. And basically, we would do everything that an end user would do, um, but we'd also do lots of navigation of the menus to make sure they do what they're supposed to do. So we would have what we call a bomb, basically, to work from. A bill of material. And um, we would have to make sure that all the content on that bomb uh, was on the disc. And then uh, each client of ours, the different studios that we did work for, had their own rules um, regarding how the discs functioned and we would have to check the discs did those things to their specifications. Um, so we could spend probably a couple of weeks doing a title. And um, even though there, were, you know, there was quite a few of us working there, it could still take a couple of weeks for us to work through a title. Then the quality control, that's the earlier step, that's much more involved. Once I got to that company, Having been doing seven years of uh, quality assurance, once I got to that company, my eyes were opened to like, wow, okay, I didn't do half the things that we're gonna have to do now. The way you start with essentially nothing, even just putting just the, the video and audio on the disc, no menus, no end screen, no nothing. You just put the disc in and the feature starts and it ends to the completed disc. And I suppose how long it takes depends on how much is actually crammed into that disc with extras and languages and subtitles. And this is something that we don't often take into consideration when we're just watching the end product. So. That's right. Um, so there's, let's say, three different kinds of discs. You have what we call a vanilla disc, which is basically a static menu just with the buttons on for your selections. 
Um, no, no fancy menu morphs or anything like that. No scene selection, nothing. Just your, um, your main menu, your play, maybe your subtitles on and off, and maybe a, a trailer or something, a couple of bonus items. Um, that would be just the feature, and that's it. Then you have a disc that's probably got quite a few trailers at the beginning, um, slightly fancier menus, still maybe just the one menu, but it may have a, mo a moving background. Um, and then, then your feature and whatever they might put at the end. But then of course you've got your complex um, discs which have multiple um, languages. So the first screen you'll get as you load the disc um, will be what we would call the initial selection menu, where you pick your language. Then it will take you into the, the part of the disc that has your language's material in it. Um, so the discs used to have um, the warnings and disclaimers at the front of the disc in what we call the trailer build. Um, now you may have watched the film and if you've left it long enough you get all the warnings afterwards. Uh, depends on the client and... Uh, well you did a video recently on Wally, which I think was a Pixar and your company had the contract with um, Buena Vista, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Now, you made some very interesting points on there about the way it branches out. Is that the correct term? Yes, uh, Siemens branching. And you've got different languages on things like that newspaper that you showed. So how is that working, do you know? Do you I'm know? not sure if I know the total technical part of it. I just know I had to test it a few times. So just what John's talking about is, um, when you're watching a film, but you or say you're Hungarian and you don't want to see a newspaper in English and have to, and if there's anything plot relevant on that newspaper, which in Wally that there is, um, they would have to put a subtitle up normally. But what they can do is seamlessly branch off to a small little um, piece of video, which has the altered animation or the altered graphic or whatever you want uh, into the Hungarian language or whichever language you choose to do it in and then it will seamlessly go back to the feature. So there's only one feature on the disc. There may be up to 10 different main languages on the disc but... Um, so there's, there's 10 different ways of playing that feature? Yes, yeah. But there's still only one main feature on it. The, uh, the foreign language elements um, will be these uh, inserts and um, they're seamlessly laid over the top so to speak. Yes, and that's another thing we take for granted that, um, when it comes up and asks you what language you're in you just select it and then expect it's all going to work flawlessly. Inevitably eventually there's going to be a disc where something has been missed. Was there ever anything that came up like that? Yes, um, there was a title very well known American series called Scrubs um, which is a great series and I wouldn't have necessarily got to see it if it not been for the job I had. And a um, number of times we kept telling them, look, every time we pick German or we pick Spanish or French, all we get is English. And the reason being was they never put the foreign language assets on the discs. But seeing as they were to be released um, in the UK, I suppose it didn't really matter. Um, now I don't know why they allowed this to happen, that's not our fault, that's not us missing anything. Um, but I'm guessing they've just built the disc in a way and thought, well, let's let it go because I know it went out in the shops that way. Uh, <laughs> um, but again, these discs are released in many territories. Um, so although they put multiple languages on the discs, um, they still get a territorial release. So obviously the French version will clearly have French audio on it, otherwise people are going to be complaining, as well as having the original language audio and uh, that kind of thing. So, Well, there's a couple of our labels over here on the Arrow and Second Side Film Sprinter Mine because they're just about the most adventurous there are mm. the, uh, packages they put together. But um, Arrow were coming under criticism because they had quality issues a couple of times and same with Second Side, they've um, managed to stop a couple of releases recently. 
Uh, the Vich was one a few months ago. It got put back because I believe they had to go back and repress all the discs after they'd done the fixes. So am I right to not be surprised that yeah. these things... Yeah, I mean, I've just picked up that uh, box set myself. Um, I've yet to watch it, but the clips I have seen, it just looked lovely. And I thought, you know, even if I don't know the story, I want to see this film because the way it's been shot looks lovely. But like you said, if, if it had been pressed, that's when they get the check disc. So that, um, we would get, at Testronics, we would get um, like a pile of 10 check discs for uh, uh, us, all of us to work on doing the menus, um, the compatibility testing, which is a matrix of 40 odd players, uh, and then the watch throughs. Um, and that's, like I said, it was the finished product. So if we then find this error, they then have to go back um, and redo the disc. Well, we've just been uh, looking through HMV today, and um, I would have purchased the Vich if they'd have had it in stock, but they didn't. But there was another recent release that we did have a look at that you'd already got, a uh, Michael Caine film. Yeah. Um, you've seen that set. What does it look like? The set is lovely. Uh, the BFI have done a really nice uh, job putting the package together. Um, and, you know, now they chose to do two separate ones. They chose to do a Blu-ray version and a 4K version. Now, you may sort of think, well, why not just make it a combo? Money, and I suppose. Money saving. So you could put it out slightly cheaper than you otherwise would? Yeah, I think so. But you know what the good thing was about that, John, was um, I found out from my friend at the BFI that the 4K version is selling far more than the Blu-ray version. So oh, yeah. uh, that is, it's, I was really chuffed to hear that uh, that was the case. It's certainly a good sign, isn't it? We had a look at it 29.95 in HMV, so I left with that remaining copy in there. We had a look at some other things you picked up off the shelf that you'd worked on, the first ones, well, you've actually got the very special pack of the Blu-ray James Bond set. I do, yeah. Um, and when we first started getting those on Blu-ray, and knowing the age of these films, you know, obviously starting off in the 60s, and this was when Blu-ray was new, so 2008, I, I know it started before that, but it wasn't released sort of worldwide until about 2008. And we started getting these titles in and we started getting the first Blu-ray players that existed, the PS3 being the main one. And you may sort of think, well, a games console? But we used to use them for the menu navigation because it was so quick. But getting the James Bond films and putting them on for the first time and just seeing how clean they were, knowing that they'd had a full restoration. And now I understand what went into that restoration. You're talking a two hour film, you're talking about 170,000 frames that they have to clean up every single one. So it's not a weekend's work really is what you're saying isn't it? No. So we don't really appreciate that but I think um, there was one boutique label in this country, a bit of a fundraiser that you heard about Trev and I think that was a remarkable amount of money to restore just a few films, what was that? It was, so um, 88 films um, decided they wanted to raise £40,000 to restore four titles. Um, and one of them, and I have it here, is what a lot of us horror fans know as a video nasty. And this is it, this is absurd. Um, so basically this cost about £10,000 to get restored uh, for a 2K transfer. Um, along with uh, three other titles and subsequently because of how much we raised we ended up raising £80,000 and they said that they were going to do a fifth title and that was the remaster of Anthropophagus the Beast. So my name, there's a second set of credits at the end of this film after the main feature credits and there's a second set of credits and that's all of us that took part in the fundraiser and basically we paid for perks. Um, so obviously one of the perks was getting these titles that we were helping to get restored I have a t-shirt with that on, which you could only get through that. You can't buy it in the shop anywhere. They kept us posted with various emails on how they're getting on. And it's months later that, you know, so not only do they set in motion the restoration of these four movies, um, well, five movies, because 88 had already released Anthropophagus the Beast. Um, so I actually have both versions. And um, I wouldn't mind doing a comparison of my own 
to see the difference between a just released on Blu-ray version and a, uh, a new remastered um, cleaned up version. Well there's a Double Bill Movies video <laughs> coming soon to YouTube. Yeah. But these were 2K restorations weren't they? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it was before the 4K was really, this is from a few years ago, so obviously now most titles are being restored in 4K. Um, now if you think that took a few months to do four films in, uh, in 2K, and you know they're not the longest films ever, um, how long is this one? Yeah, runtime 94 minutes. So you're talking these big blockbuster movies that can be two hours, two and a half, three hour films. Um, and they're doing 4K scans, um, that's going to be two, three times the amount of work put in to the restoration. So they have got to sell a hell of a lot of these to make the investment back. Yeah. And that's something we all need to appreciate a bit more, I would say. So if you see a, a recent release and you think, I'm not spending £25, it's not actually <laughs> quite the bad value you maybe think it is. So, and in fact, we... We went through a few today, didn't we? And uh, yeah. I think we almost cleared the shop out of 4Ks. With, uh, <laughs> I picked up Ambulance a few days ago in the Newbury HMV, That's and you right. picked up one today. Yeah. But there's, there's a few other rather big titles that you did. At, was it Testronics? I think Apocalypse Now was the Blu-ray that went through there. Yeah, that was pretty special to get in Francis Ford's Coppola's Apocalypse Now that contained both versions of the film. And I definitely did a watch through on both versions multiple times in a day maybe so you know getting to sit and watch apocalypse now two or three times a day yeah it's not no hardship really and um the remake of the most recent remake of king kong i think it is what was that 2004 was it yeah, this was peter yeah. jackson's king kong this was one of the rare titles we had before it actually got released on cinema um so most of the time when we do these titles they've already been out in the cinema and you know we're not seeing anything new apart from the bonus material. The bonus material would be all we would see before the general public. Um, but this was a rare occasion where we had the disc um, prior to going out in cinemas. And then one day you had to go in early one morning to look at a particular Disney film that had you almost hypnotised and that all me. Oh yes, yeah. I mean, um, so our, our general day was uh, seven o'clock till three o'clock in the afternoon, um, or if we started doing shift work, then it was three till eleven. But one morning, going in at seven o'clock and having to sit down at a station with five players on it and do compatibility testing on Alice in Wonderland was was a bit sort of trippy and um yes i wasn't watching the whole film i'm glad i wasn't watching the film because i may have said can someone else do it please yeah that was a little bit off-putting first thing in the morning <laughs> <laughs> okay now we're going to go through a few titles that you brought with you trev to actually highlight some of the work you did these first ones are a testronics i think that's right john um okay so this film uh I just did probably some compatibility testing on it and um, but I bought it myself because I really liked what I saw and had I not worked on it at this company or this kind of job I may never have heard of the film and it's a very good film uh, The Fighting Temptations um, starring Cuba Gooding Jr and Beyonce so that's one that we will need to look out for. But yeah. Only released on DVD by the look of it so far. So far, yes. Um, but it's on Paramount and that was one of our clients. So our clients were Buena Vista, which is basically Disney, um, all your, your Miramax, um, so many titles, not just your Disney animated films, but... Um, and then, so we did some BBC stuff, Universal, that was one of our clients, so many titles there. No 20th Century Fox, so I never got to do any Star Wars or anything like that. But there was a few little smaller labels and, and things in there as well. And that takes us on to a Disney Pixar that you brought. Yeah, Ratatouille. So um, the excellent thing about this is not only is it a great film, um, but on here, there is a game. And it is called Gusto's Gourmet Game. And so basically I had to test this game um, in all the different languages that are on the disc. Thankfully on this particular disc there's only about three different languages. Um, but that means I had to play it all the way through uh, to make sure that the correct language cards come up 
so that the people in France or Spain or wherever are playing it can understand what they're supposed to be doing. And that again is something we wouldn't ordinarily think about as we're just viewing a disc in our own particular language. No, that's it. Now, this is not necessarily the skew that I would have worked on, um, but what I can safely say is because this was a re-release uh, where they made it 3D and the original one didn't have this slip cover on it, but this disc here will be exactly the same one that came out in the first SKU. So I would imagine, let's for example, they press 20,000 discs and, um, you know, 15,000 go out as your first SKU, your original release. Um, and then if maybe they don't sell as well as they expect or they've specifically put them aside for a different release, i.e. this release with 3D. Basically, it's exactly the same disc and they may have had stored somewhere or they may have literally just repressed it. So this is the new disc. This is the one that would have um, the new lot of quality control. Um, this one would already have had the quality control and quality assurance already done on it. So when you get yourself a nice steelbook of something and it's been commissioned by Zabby or um, one of the other uh, outlets then um, you may open it up and find that the disc looks exactly the same as the one you already have and you think well why does it not match the the packaging um, that's because there'll be thousands of discs left over that aren't packaged and they'll be specifically for that reason so that someone else can package them differently and make a special edition make a steel book um, or a fancy slip cover version you know that kind of thing. Um, so it's already got the disc face printed on it, I think is the detail there. Yes, it? so in that respect, um, this disc, like I said, will be exactly the same as the one I worked on. The only reason this is different is because they've done a 3D version of it. Um, but just repackaging something, and, and there was a slip cover on the original Ratatouille because we used to have it. Um, but then they've just had to print up a new one because they can't necessarily once you've done a limited run of something, you can't then reprint it. That's your limited run. Um, so the next version has to be not completely different, but it has to have something different on it to differentiate um, that it's not from the original stock. Then at the beginning of our Blu-ray work at Testronic, I got to work on this lovely movie. Um, knowing it's from the 1930s, and seeing how pristine the picture was, um, looked like it was filmed yesterday. Uh, so Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And not only that, but it, it's so packed with um, bonus material, all sorts of games, a studio tour of Hyperion Studios, which is where Disney started out. And some of it's quite interactive as well. And if you load these Disney discs <coughs> and you get to a certain point and you get a little character on screen doing a funny dance or something or something relevant from the movie may be spinning. That's what we call a Java load screen. And the, the Java script is what's used to make the menus animate. Obviously someone has to write that Java script um, that's relevant to how the client wants the menus to work. Um, so that's also going to be quality tested before uh, it's even put into menu form. Um, I suppose the point we're trying to make or understand is the amount of steps. It's not just a case of getting the footage, making a scan of it, putting it on disc and releasing it. There's thousands or uh, of hours of work between hundreds and hundreds of people um, you know, who are earning a living, making sure that these things uh, work cor correctly and um, that you don't have problems when you get them home. Um, but invariably, things will get missed and problems will occur. Uh, it may be a player is not quite able to handle certain aspects of the disc, um, but another player, it might work fine. So some someone will be happy and, hey, yeah, this, this works fine, what's the problem? And especially if the, the players that are used in the authoring house, if everything works fine on there, they are not gonna know if when the end user um, purchases it and they have a different player, that um, it may trip up. 
I think Donnie Darko was a recent example of that from Arrow, wasn't it? I think that's right, yes. Um, but uh, so some of the perks of this job, so these titles here are from when I did my year at Sony. Now this uh, Cairo Emerald live at the BBC concert only has a single audio stream. It's a two channel LPCM and that is an uncompressed audio. It doesn't have to be DTS HD mastered to be uncompressed. And basically I was the only one that did the watch through on it. So I got sort of the final disc before maybe it was the check disc. It's been a while now, so I can't quite remember. One of the reasons I brought this is because I totally fell in love with the concert and the music um, and her as an artist. And I felt, wow, I've worked on that. I've contributed um, to the making of this product here uh, in, in more of a way than I did when I do these. Um, and uh, so I had to have it in my collection. So it's quite special to you, that one. That one is, yeah. Yeah, and I must say, I always enjoy concerts on Blu-ray and uh, they look great on a, mm. in a home cinema. Sounds so, great too. Yeah, so another concert I got to do um, was this by Willie Deville. Now, this is not an artist I'm particularly fond of, but um, this was a perk of the job in the sense that I got given this from my colleagues at Sony. It is a, an Eagle Vision disc. Now, we had quite a lot of Eagle Vision titles at Testronic, so I got to watch many concerts um, from many different kinds of bands. But this one in particular, now I'm a drummer. Uh, there is a percussionist playing in this concert. And certain shots, when Willie Deville is the main aspect of the picture and in the percussionist is in the background, everything's in time. But then there were other shots that were perhaps tighter or only had the percussionist in shot. And what was being played was out of time with the audio. And it wasn't out of sync. It was literally the wrong audio was put, or the wrong video it was put with the wrong piece of audio. So uh, because it was in the quality control stage and still the building part of the disc, I was able to say to the producer who was um, in charge of this title, this needs to be looked at. And it actually got sent back for a re-edit. But um, lo and behold, a week later, I got the disc back and it had been re-edited and everything was in sync. So I think again, it may only have the one audio stream on it, in which case, again, I was the only quality controller to work on this particular disc at that stage of it anyway. Because if you go onto my channel and um, watch my very small series, which is only two parts at the moment, called How Physical Media Is Made, uh, I talk step by step uh, what goes into the creation of these discs. Um, and so far, we're still in the quality control stage. Um, haven't even got to what I did at Testronic in the quality assurance stage. Um, could be a very long series by the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now this one's got quite a little funny story. Again, this is another title I would not have ever dreamt of owning in my collection had I not got to see it at, at work. Um, so this is the limited edition uh, indicator release of Otley. And he's basically a petty criminal. Um, and it's a lot of fun and frolics going on. But one thing I noticed, because when we do the watch throughs on these, um, you have to have the subtitles running and mainly to see that the subtitles are in time with the dialogue on screen. But this particular one, I was sitting there watching it and as I said, enjoying the film and uh, a very lovely Ford Zephyr was on screen, but the subtitle didn't say Zephyr. It said Ford Z-Tech. <laughs> so thankfully I picked up on that and I got them to correct it. And if you buy this disc, it should most definitely say Zephyr, not Z-Tech. Okay, so um, as my time at Testronic was coming to an end, um, I think they knew things were going the way they went and we all got made redundant, but I was sent up to London to work for a company called Sony DADC. And uh, for the couple of days I was there, this was the title that they got me to do quality control watch through on. That was the first time I'd actually done quality control as opposed to quality insurance. Um, so any of you that have this title in your collection, I was one of the few that did the quality control on the Blu-ray disc. Then, subsequently, I ended up working for this company and that's when I did the year at Sony. And uh, 
basically working on these lovely and varying titles. But we should say we looked for them all in HMV today and couldn't find any of them. No, these would be old out of print titles now, so if you want them they'll have to be on the second hand market. Well I can see four, I can nab right now. <laughs> so um, I think we've had a great time today Trevor. Yeah looking, definitely. Looking around HMV and CEX, I think um, I think there are going to be quite a few of you that take more notice of Trevor's channel from now on. I think he's just shown us there how much actually goes into this disc production. There's more to it than we tend to realise. I've only done smaller releases myself. And one time on a film we shot in Germany, a documentary we shot on the Nürburgring, I did the subtitles because they were speaking English and that took longer to put together than it did the whole the rest of the disc. So much more goes into these than we at times think it does. Yeah, we, you may remember John that I mentioned and you saw on my channel that I was holding the backs of some discs that I was working on, which I can't tell you. I can't even tell John now and I haven't told John those uh, what those discs are. But one of them, this is an episodic disc. This is just over three hours of viewing took me nine hours to QC. So there's a little insight into um, what can kind of not go wrong, but uh, how long this process can be for the, the hundreds and hundreds of people in this industry that do what I used to do and sort of still do. And if the company responsible for those discs is watching this, there is no truth to the story that he brought copies over for me. So anyway, until <laughs> the next video, bye-bye for now. <laughs>